What's up, peeps? Hey. Uh, Patty and Barry here. I I'm... That's Barry. You can decide who I am. <laughs> I've, I'm informed of now. Um, <laughs> we're back with another deep dive. Um, you guys may have seen our first deep dive. I was going to make a very inappropriate gesture. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, no, I know what you were going to do. <laughs> no, no. Oh, wow. It doesn't matter... Uh, you may have seen show. our first deep dive, uh, which is about a, our uh, short film, Iris. Uh, uh, click the little eye icon if you haven't, and uh, you'll see, uh, you can watch that beforehand. Yeah, and want. hopefully watch the short, because any of these deep dives, if you've gotten to this point, you haven't seen the short, you should probably check out here and go and check out the short. If you're on Patreon, um, there will be a code below to watch uh, Retribution and Real House. Um, if you're elsewhere, go buy it on Real House. <laughs> it's, on, it's on Real House. <laughs> you, you can purchase it there. You can, and it's very affordable and reasonable for for the short film that it is. So that is a disclosure. That discloses what short we're doing this about. Retribution. Retribution. A film by Patty Murray. <laughs> a, a Celtic pleasure media film. That's not what it says in the poster. <laughs> that was John Lynch designed the poster. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so first bit of trivia. John Lynch designed the poster. Um, what a fucking set of posters. I, they're the, the two posters that I have hanging in my house in Atlanta. It really captured everything I wanted it to with the posters. Mm. And yet again, Mike Shawcross took the stills for them. Um, mm. And they were absolutely... It, you can't have a great poster without great stills. Truth. And, you know, that Retribution is a testament to that. Um, retribution was our... The Three Don'ts. Iris. Cheese box. Yeah. Retribution was our fourth film together. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy because by that point, it felt, in my head, it felt like we'd been working together forever. You see, the funny thing is, I remember, so the, my earliest memory of Retribution, Retribution. was... Uh, the Don'ts. I was on The Don'ts. You were telling me about this um, this action film that you wanted to do that was about this motorcyclist who was like chasing down people and... Uh, I was kind of trying to get the story out of you, but you kind of didn't want to tell me. You were kind of like trying to keep the reveal a reveal. Yeah. And then the more we talked about it, you were like, okay, look, so this is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I'd only written it very, like right before then as well. It was when I was in, uh, I was flying over to Scotland to, to meet Andy Stewart for the first time. Hmm. And that would have been like May 2015. That would have been just before the... Just before the don'ts. The don'ts. Because we shot Remnant in August. So I went out to visit Andy in May. Mm. And on the flight over, I wrote Retribution. Yeah. And then I got Andy to sit down and read it and critique it and give me notes on it. Mm. Um, and so then I came back and we were working on the don'ts together. Yeah, I, I remember it distinctly. We were like walking past Brown Thomas and you were telling me the story and you were telling me like all the, the bits and pieces and I was like, I think I was trying to be very, uh, I think with you, because I didn't want to give the reveal away, I was trying to be very like, oh, but like there's scenes where it's like a motorbike driving and you'd be able to do cool stuff with the movie. And but you see, the thing is, I, I think at the time you had someone else in mind to be DOP. I don't think so. Uh, I think you had, because I remember when you pitched the idea. <gasps> oh, there was somebody else who wanted to be DOP. Oh, was that what it was? the very first minute. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I remember. His name starts with A and ends with Aaron. <laughs> and uh i remember like you pitching like just pitching the film and stuff like that and i was like look it's like i don't know if you have like a dop in mind already <laughs> or whatever it's like i'm just saying i have the equipment if we want to do like some cool bike stuff it's like i can do, use the movie and we can hang out you know the side of a car and get all the motorbike stuff it's like even if i don't do the rest it was like I, I can do that. Yeah, so. it's like, can I can I help out? On, I, I on the that second section? we started working on the don'ts, I think I knew I wanted you to do it. And I think when I had the conversation with Aaron later, I was just like, "Is it cool with you?" Because I know you were really interested in that project, and you mm. know. And Aaron was like, "No, definitely go for it. Like that's yeah. that's the person Aaron is. He's Same. very understanding." Um, and also with the casting of it, that's an interesting one to kind of lead into because similarly with the casting, a lot some of the people there was a lot of changes to the casting throughout. Yeah. Um. Adam Moylan plays the lead. Uh, the biker. The biker. He doesn't have a name. <laughs> um, How Nicholas Winding Refn of you. Oh, I know. Yeah, exactly. Driver. Um, <laughs> but uh, obviously, uh, if you've watched the film, you know that Drive was a massive influence on it. Um, but uh, Adam Moylan was the biker, but he was 
he was my first choice to play the biker, but I wanted him to prove that he wanted the role. Like mm. I didn't want to just go, yeah, here's a role for you. You know, we just done the don'ts and um, I wanted him to, to be hungry for it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I did look at other people. I'd looked at Kevin Cully Jr. who was in the cheese box and ensnared. Um, but Adam was on his, uh, what's that thing where you go to America? Best in behavior. College? <laughs> Adam oh, no. has never been on his best <laughs> behavior. Um, uh, J1 visa. Oh yeah, J1 visa. He was in the States on his J1 visa and he, he did an audition. He did an audition tape and sent it on and I was like, yeah, a couple of points to note, you know, mm. you're whispering the character would be more like this and he came back and he did another one and that was what I wanted to see was this ability to go out and, and really listen to the direction and try yeah. and capture the character. So, um, Adam, I think was one of the first, Adam and Nick were Nicholas Vince were the two first casting choices. Shout out to the chatter. And my first time. Yeah, I that wrote was... it in May. I met Nick in August on the Remnant shoot. Mm. And I knew at that point that I wanted him. I knew coming onto the Remnant shoot that I, I wanted him for uh, Father Argyle in Retribution. Mm. And I was nerded out so bad when I met him because you've heard me say it a million times, but I'm a gigantic Hellraiser fan. Um... And Nick was How just, cool is it that we've now done like five films on Nick? It's, it's awesome because, like, I said, this is a dude that gave me nightmares. Like, yeah, you know that <laughs> scene so where cool. he sticks his fingers into Kirsty's mouth just traumatizes me. Mm. Um, but like, I just remember that uh, how scared I was because I remember saying to myself, "Don't ask him on set. Don't ask him on set. It's the worst thing you could possibly ever do. Like, just yeah, yeah. wait till you get back to Ireland. Maybe he'll add you on Facebook. Then you can maybe." And then I just remember hypes, like building it up so much in my head. And then when, when I got back from the shoot, he had added me and I was just like, hey, do you want to read this script? And there's a part and he straight away was like, this is great. Yeah, how can I help? I'd love to be involved. I was like, what an amazing, amazing yeah. human. And then the other cast, cast uh, Courtney McKeown, I'd, we'd worked with her on, um, uh, I'd worked with her on Love we Need had, You. We hadn't worked with her on The Don'ts at that stage. No, either. she hadn't been involved with The Don'ts. I'd worked with her on, on I Love Need You um, and... That was my first time working with Courtney, actually. That was your first time, Retribution, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, Nigel I love, Mercier. I love that room. Oh, the, the lighting room. in... Yeah, oh. in that room. That's my home bedroom, which is also a bit seen in the don'ts. Spoilers. What? Spoilers. For the don'ts. No, just in general, just that we're giving away like our locations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, but it's fun to do that in a deep dive. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, but it's fun because it does not. The great thing is with your lighting, that room does not look the same in both those films. Yeah, I, I love lighting that. Like Retribution was one of my favorite lighting. Yeah, we should talk films. a bit about that because like lighting was such a huge part. Because mm. I remember you had originally said to me, it was like I want neons, and I was like, okay. It was like, well, I have LEDs and they're bicolor, but I don't have neons. And then that produces a whole other problem of like, okay, well, how do I get pinks and purples and greens yeah. when I don't have like gels to do it? And then luckily enough for me, Vachin happened to be cleaning out her place and found, this is to show how old we are. You remember the, the projectors from school that used to, you, yes, you put the clear acetate. Yeah. Yeah. The vinyl acetate and you'd write on it yeah. and it'd appear behind on the checker. She had ones of those, but they were colored pages. Oh, okay. Uh, so they were colored pages for different projects or whatever. But they actually worked. They sit in front of the gels and they were all like pinks and purples yeah. and blues and oranges. And you were able to mix and match the colors and get like really crazy colors yeah. using the lights. And because because the LEDs don't get warm, you didn't have to worry about the melting or yeah. anything. Like They just work like normal gels, but just crazy colors. And yeah, like, he really added it because I, from the first minute I wrote it, I knew purple played a massive part. Yeah. Um, and I think to get kind of deep and art wanky about it, uh, it's it's a thematic thing as well, though. It's not, um, it's not just, oh, I think purple's a cool color. I want to light it mm. that way. I think... Because if you think of what colors get mixed to make purple, yeah, and th that kind of what colors, what those colors represent individually, mm. I think it defines the biker quite perfectly. Yeah, you know, so I think for you having you come on board as well, knowing how good you are at lighting, 
I knew that that was a really important part of it because the light in Retribution is as much a character as the biker or father. Yeah, it, well. it was cool. It was fun to do um, to do different stuff like that and to, to really kind of push uh, even even how I knew to mix color. Yeah, uh, like live and stuff. Speaking like that. of light, though, we you did have some issues with the lights used in the church. Yeah, because. Because at the time I only had two LED panels. Yeah. Uh, one of uh, when we were doing the church scene, because everything we lit, we lit majoritively blue with kind of like a, a purpley, kind pinkish of, yeah. kind of hint. So uh, that was kind of always the edge light, but the church was the first one that we completely flipped because it was so important. We wanted it to stand out visually, so we flipped the colors where it's majoritively kind of that pinky purple color, and then accented with that kind of blue. And, um, yeah, we, because we, I knew we were doing the church, I borrowed some LED lights from a guy I know, uh, Benny in the sound factory in Athlone. Shout Thanks, out to Benny. Benny. Uh, I borrowed some, uh, LEDs from him. The unfortunate thing is because mine were video lights and his were not. There they was, were stage lighting. Effectively. They were stage lighting. There was uh, a rolling shutter issue between uh, the lights. It just means they were. Just running at a different frequency to uh, my lights. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, we did have some banding. And I know that for Mike Shawcross with his stills, it caused him some issues in post trying to clean them up. And because just, I know that blue light creates a very... It, I, I remember from having to do it, I, fit, I filmed a gig once and mm. there was a blue light shining straight down on the... Blue, blue is where the noise lives. Yeah, basically. Blue is the noisy channel, always. Yeah. Um, but yeah, kind of that's the light, as you say, is such a vital part. But kind of just jumping back quickly to the cast, uh, we got Nigel Mercier on. I had worked with Nigel once previously on uh, a short called Devil on My Back. And um, that was also your first time this working with Nigel. Also, my first time working with Nigel. And, and Nigel he, is a scream. Yeah, and he spent like the entire shoot in his underwear. Just being a messer as yeah. well. <laughs> just taking the absolute piss. Um, and Nigel's an incredible actor. He's yet again a very established actor. So, And he came in last minute because the guy that I wanted to play the part of Father Stanton. Yeah, Stanton. Uh, had to, He was stuck in New York and couldn't get back. Um, a guy named Richard Lynch. He's a personality from Limerick, like a web oh, personality. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, he, he was the know. original choice. And Nigel was meant to be... Uh, a priest that got cut from the film entirely who got killed under the oh, archway. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, that. And so last minute I was like, okay, Nigel, you're no longer that priest. You're now going to be killed in a kitchen in your underwear with the toaster, um, which he was only too happy about. Do you want to talk about that shot? That shot was... That's still possibly my favourite sequence we've done today. That's, like, one of the only... <clears throat> one of the, the only shots that, like, every single time, without fail, that we've been at a screening gotten a huge reaction people wince and like oh. <laughs> it's uh, yet again go back to drive because drive was a gigantic influence on this movie um, and i'll always i i don't like these people that are like no i, I wouldn't say it was really like no it was like drive because mm. i realized with watching drive i was like god he's telling such a compelling narrative with so little dialogue just mm. in actions just in lighting just in you know um but yeah it's that moment in drive where oh no there's a spoiler for drive here <laughs> But uh, he like stamps a dude's head into the ground effectively in an elevator. Oh, um, American History X style. Oh yeah, but like he's stamping on it, stamping on it. Next thing you just see it like shatter, and you're like, oh, what the fuck, like, you know? Yeah. And so that effect was really powerful to me, um, partially because of the actor. That, I can't think of her name. Kerry Mulligan's reaction to it mm. is so like this guy that she thought she knew, and just seeing how vicious he can he actually can be. be it had this big profound effect I felt on me. So I really wanted to kind of, because of the nature of what this um, character is dealing with, what he's going through and what his agenda is, I was like, this, this has to be a violent murder, mm. you know? And if you watch this, well, if you see, you must've seen the short. Um, why are you here? Why are you not? here? Spoilers. Uh, <laughs> the, the kills escalate. And that was actually Andy Stewart at script level gave me that mm. advice because the kills were also in a different order. Yeah. And then Andy was like, wouldn't it make more sense for him to, you know, shoot a guy or, you know, shoot a guy. I think it was originally stabbing in there. No, stabbing is more personal. Shoot one guy. Yeah, that was, that was the thing that we decided. That's why yeah. we wanted the end to be. 
exactly the way it is. So like a, st- a shooting and then two shootings and then strangulation and then the toaster is obviously very, very extreme. So it was almost like these kills were escalating as it went along. <laughs> um, Crescendo is going to fall over. <laughs> Her head is stuck in the... Oh, no. <laughs> there it is. Um, oh, she got out. But yeah, one of the... So as I say, with the cast, you had Nigel Mercier, we had Graham Gill. I think it was both of our first times working with Graham. Mm. Um, delighted to get to work and with him. And it was him. not our last. Yes, thankfully. He's a great, great actor to work with. Um, and I had a cameo in it where I got choked the fuck out. As is in, if you watch the little BTS snippets, <laughs> I believe Adam says that to me. He's like, yeah. I choked you the fuck out. <laughs> um, uh, I think a huge props has to be given as well to, um, that was the majority, uh, Chris Rowley and Ken McKeown. Mm-hmm. Did a great job in the bar sequence. Um, but uh, And PJ Quinn was the... As our stunt stunt bikist. Yes. That's Which a... we'll get back to the whole bike thing in a minute because that is a story in and of itself. <laughs> um, but uh, I think one of the other main people that deserves a lot of props for retribution. We had a great crew. We had Aaron. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sean Mercier was on board as the... Was Sean AC? Sean was AC. And uh, did he do some of the sound? I, I know, I know. Mike Joyce did it all. Yeah, all the church stuff. But I think was Sean helping out. I think with Sean helped out in a lot of capacities on that yeah. short. He was. Kind he, of he was kind of yeah. He was kind of a multi tool. Yeah, and we had Mike Shawcross on stills and Noel Coley on BTS video, and then we had, I, I would say one of the biggest shout outs has to go to Becky Toberty on the makeup for, for that. Sure. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna give her a shout out when you were talking about getting choked out, but then I was like, oh, yeah, I'll I know because of the yeah, yeah, the yeah. indentations. Oh, so good. Um, I I think that was the moment where I really knew how much huge of, of a huge potential Becky yeah. had as a makeup artist on Retribution. Um, because even stuff like just to okay, the insight here for the toaster sequence uh, mm. is basically that uh, that was a watermelon. With we, we bashed a watermelon in latex um, and couple of little bits of skin tone you know coloring yeah um but uh it was it was actually barry's suggestion um because i was thinking all this stuff about one shout to out to film red <laughs> <laughs> um it was one of those things where i i was wanted to build a prosthetic head i contacted like makeup artists and they were like that'll be like 1700 euros for a very basic head and i was like oh what <laughs> this short is already going to be my most costly short to date. Yeah, we did a lot of people yeah. people to import. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so p- importing people. Um, boys. Uh, but they're all badgers now, which is that's awesome. That's true. And yeah, Retribution was a very formative Celtic Badger film, I think. Mm. I think it was the first one we did under the Celtic Badger media brand. Shit, yeah, it would be. So yeah, it was. Wow, really, that's yeah. pretty cool. That's that's crazy. Retribution was the first time I think we had because we'd been Furious Badgers on Iris and Cheesebox. We did it with Oilboro Productions. Yes, that's and right. And so yeah, I I think Shit, Retribution man. was. I think first. that was a revelation for me just there. Yeah, crazy. Because we shot it in November, but I didn't get you the slate until January. But we yeah in December we had the discussion about. Celtic Badger yeah. Media, so I think, yeah, because we moved into post around January. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Shit, man. I think we oftentimes call Frame the first because we shot it in January. Yeah, and, and that was the on first one with the slate. But I think Retribution retroactively is the the first. Yeah, because it was the first one that went out to festivals branded as Celtic with Badger a Media. a Celtic Badger Media film at the start. Shit. And that beautiful gate sound effect, man. Oh, my God. Yeah. My gate at home makes that noise. Really? It's so weird. Every time I open it, I see the opening of Retribution in my head. Because it's like, ur, ur, that cr- horrible, creaky gate mm. sound. Um, but yeah, uh, Becky Toberty's makeup, as I was saying, is the, it was, as much as the lighting was a character, the makeup, it was the first, I'd been on Andy's sh- uh, shoot. Um, I'd been on Andy's uh, remnant set. And I'd seen how he'd done a lot of the... Him and Grant had done a lot of the special effects makeup. And mm. I was like blown away by it. Because, you know, in my head, this was stuff that you could only do when you had a big team and loads of money. And then when I saw, like, how they did uh, headshots and stuff, mm. I was like, that's we can do that. Like, mm. We need a bicycle comp- pump compressor, quick, quick, you know... Quick release. Quick fill. And uh, tubing and bl- fake blood. 
and we can do unreal headshots. And that was our first headshot, that one with Graham. Yeah. And that blood is still on my ceiling at home. It's because uh, you're too short to reach it. No, Kathy tried cleaning it right away, but <laughs> it'll never go. And Piper off and just turn around and look up at the roof and be like, there's your, there's your blood, Daddy. I'm like, no, it's not my blood. That's Graham Gills. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, okay. Um, uh, we got really lucky with the... And then, so there was that, but Becky did the the strangulation. Mm-hmm. And, and she did a lot of stuff in the church sequence with yeah. Nick. Um, and the, and her big accomplishment was the the watermelon yeah uh, toaster sequence. <coughs> uh, who was it? Was it Adam that we have to give a shout out to for cutting the uh, cut the plug off the toaster? So I, I don't know who made that suggestion. I was busy like I think it might have been Adam. He was like I think because I think he was worried that if he was hitting Nigel with the toaster that uh, the plug would come out and, yeah. and hit him. It's so funny because one person out of, out of everyone who's seen Retribution, one person has come to me and said. Was that a wireless toaster? No, <laughs> <A> wireless toaster. <laughs> and I was like, it could have been a kettle lead <laughs> yeah. just unplugged. I thought it was brilliant. I was like, I'm so that's Hawkeye, like fair play. Um, I don't think I've ever noticed. And then some of the other kind of instrumental cast crew were people like that weren't necessarily on set were people like John Lynch and uh, David Malcolm. Dave Malcolm did the score, right? Which yeah, the score Holy is one of those balls. things. The score like. Because you always talked about like this kind of like synth. thumping synth sound the whole way through. And I was kind of like, at the time I was just getting into gunship. Mm, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I can, I can really see it. Like this, this feels right. And um, then when we actually, when you sent me the first pass of the score, it was like. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's funny because where that came from for me was uh, being a John Carpenter fan and mm. taking that drive influence and. Drive kind of had some Carpenter influence, but it was still its own beast with the score, the soundtrack. Yeah. But then I really wanted that. I, w- I said it to Dave Malcolm. I was like, don't look necessarily to like Halloween or, or, you know, the big Carpenters. Like go back to his first big feature, Assault on Precinct 13, and listen mm. to the music in that because I want it grimy. Like yeah, I don't yeah. want it super clean and super, you know. And it, Anytime we've seen it at festivals, the room shakes. Yeah, holy shit. When that, that thud of like the... When you're in like horror with hundreds of other horror fans, yeah. it's just like the whole room is literally shaking. It was like, this is awesome. Yeah. And it's one of the, I think this is one of the reasons that I love Retribution so much is that the score is a character. Mm. The lighting is a character. The special effects makeup is a character. Like, yeah, yeah. It was one of those films where everything came together to make it what it was. There's mm. no like, you, you're not like, oh, well, the best thing about Retribution is... X. Yeah, you know the performances like it, everyone really I'll, I'll be honest uh, the performance that Adam put in in the church scene yeah I to was this like day. yeah to this day I was like that's probably my favorite performance that Adam has done and what was incredible with that was we'd always said you know Adam is he's like a puppy he's hard to keep control of on sets he yeah. runs around he has fun he teases people he plays he's literally a puppy Tim Curry looking puppy um, <laughs> Tim Puppy Tim Puppy yes that is Adam's new nickname <laughs> you heard it here first <laughs> um, but in Retribution I remember telling him you know how vital that church scene was and yeah. how his character was conflicted with all of these emotions you know, anger, sadness, happiness. You'd even feel a bit happy knowing you're in that moment and you're going to get your revenge. Um, but see, he literally stood in one spot for three hours, like unless he was, yeah. we were rolling and he had to move. It was um, it was impressive. It was the, the most respect I've ever had for Adam was on set and retribution and, and how much he put in. Him and Nick really played well off each other. Mm. Like, you know, he... What he, it was like watching a stage play and as much as yeah. he gave to Nick, Nick gave back to him. So mm. there was like, it was a brilliant chemistry between the two. Yeah, it was um, great. Adam asked me to shout abusive things at him from off screen to get him in the moment, yeah. um, which was, you'd think it would be great. I was like, yeah, I get to shout abuse at Adam. But by the end of it, I felt terrible because I was yeah. shouting really horrible things at him because yeah. I knew how... And I would then kind of go back and he'd be like, no, like keep going, like yeah. get worse, make like, say more horrible things. Um, <coughs> um, moving into production, mm. uh, we had a lot of uh, people to bring over from UK and house and stuff like that. Um, 
So Mike came over, uh, Nick came over, uh, Mike, Mike Joyce, Joyce came, came down, down from Dublin. Dublin. Uh, I came up from Galway. You know, like that was a pretty. I mean, up until probably intervention, that was probably one of the most, like. Yeah, most people brought over for a, yeah. for a shoot. Um. Um. Yeah. So, because those people were over, we had a very limited oh weekend. My God, it was crazy. And it was it was We've very days though. I I to be honest, the majority of shit is a blur. Oh, I know. Because but we, we met our so days. Much... Like, we, we weren't horrendously overscheduled on Retribution. Which blows my mind. I because, know. for example, we, we did this scene with Nigel Mercier. With the toaster and everything. Which had to be wrapped by... F- a... Was it 8 o'clock? No, because we had to be leaving for 8 to get to... We had to be leaving for 8 to get to the church for 9. And then we had from 9 until midnight. Yeah. So we had 3 hours in the church to get... 33 shots. 33 shots. Which was insane. That is stupid. <laughs> but we got so lucky that between hopping on the movie and getting it all... Shooting it all on the movie. Shooting yeah, it all on the movie and allowing Adam and Nick to get into that play-like performance. Hmm. And yet again, Adam and Nick had no time to rehearse before this. Like This wasn't like they had been doing two weeks of rehearsals leading up to it. Yeah. And, like This was like they were effectively meeting for the first time. Like, yeah. At the church, which was like to get that level of performance and chemistry out of them was was, it was crazy. Phenomenal, yeah, um, um, the church scene. Yeah, we shot that like you said earlier, kind of like a stage yeah. play. Like we we jumped on the movie, and I kind of like moved around and circled. We did that awesome overhand pass. Yeah, yeah, that was our first time kind of doing a camera move together. Yeah, that was awesome. It was. Uh, I was like up in a little. Um, like was a, was I up and you passed it up to me? You did not the first move around or did I move? Did I pass it up to you? Oh, I no, you, I definitely passed it up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I would have been way too scared to... Yeah, because I remember spotting the monitor in the corner. Yeah, I remember that and light stand and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we did our first camera move where it was, I, I passed the camera up. Yeah, you, you started from like looking at Nick and then like moved up. And kind of revealed Adam, and then I like took it off your hands, and then I and went like raised way it all the way up. It was basically almost a crane we, shot. Yeah, yeah, we we simulated a crane shot yeah. inside a church with the movie, and it was a small church. When we got there, I realized how small it was. Uh, another interesting fact: it was actually shot on two different cameras uh, and color matched. It was A seven S and was it the C one hundred? No. Black Magic. Black Magic pocket cinema pocket camera. Cinema camera. Yeah, true. All the stuff in the bar was done with the pocket cinema camera. Yeah. <coughs> we need to talk about the bar as well because we talked about the church. Yeah. But the bar, we got so lucky. Nigel's scene was done with uh, the Black Magic. All the bike stuff was A7S. All the bike stuff was A7S. The church stuff was A7S. A7S. The intro? A7S. The movie outside the church. Yeah, or A7S. The castle at night. And uh, we get to the castle in a minute as well. <laughs> Shout <laughs> so out to Bun Raddy. Yeah, we'll talk locations, I guess. Yeah. We've talked cast and crew. and uh, Locations-wise, we talked a lot about the church, but we'll jump back. Um, the, we've said that the hotel room was at my room. Mm-hmm. Um, it, hotel. It was a brothel. It was, it was, it was a whorehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Not even a brothel. A whorehouse. Um, yeah, it, was an, it really needed to look skeezy like and you really achieved that and and fair play to Kathy on set dressing as well she did a great job um, yeah those those velvet bed sheets man and Graham's yeah, robe Graham's Kathy robe. did costume design as well oh actually one little thing that since this is a deep dive and people should get everything if you watch Retribution or if you've watched it which you should have Adam's costume is kind of a nod to Resident Evil 4 when I designed Adam's costume, from the, it was one of the first things that I decided on about Retribution was he would be wearing effectively like black combats, black boots, um, and that. Do you know how hard it was to get that jacket with the trim? Because like I the said, wool it, Kathy, trim. the wool trim, like mm. that is basically <clears throat> Leon S. Kennedy's jacket from Resident Evil Four. Because I, I was like, Kathy was like, it has to be like Leon's jacket from Resident Evil Four. <laughs> That's what I see him wearing in my head since day one, and body armor underneath. Um, it was a huge nod to Resi 4 um, and yeah I, I I think it really stood out looking at the, the poster with him yeah. that costume 
it, it's it works really really well. Do we, um, do we want to talk about Adam splitting his pants? <laughs> on, except for when Adam split his pants. <laughs> um, on, you, on the first first time we were shooting with Adam. And, and he, he went, had to go like, he his went leg to, over the bike. He went to throw his leg over the bike and it was just like... <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, you got me the wrong size. And so Kathy was like, no, no, no. That's the size you said. Yeah. That was, um, that was the first way Kathy on as a costume designer as well. Mm. And she, she was very good at getting everybody's measurements. Nick was in the UK so we were yeah. really relying on her to, to you know make sure Nick's measurements worked out and everything mm. um, but yeah that was, as I said it was just every moving part worked um, uh, back to locations so yeah that was the the whorehouse <laughs> I love that word man <laughs> <laughs> It's just so what it is. Do you know yeah. what I mean? There's no hiddenness no <laughs> in the word like that. Um, and then the bar scene. The bar scene was a local bar in Bridgetown called Cooney's. Um, Shout out Cooney's. Uh, which we got very lucky in that uh, we were getting ready to set up and you were setting up lights and everything. And then he was like, oh, there's lights behind the bar. Oh, yeah. And you turned them on and there were these neon purple yeah. lights. It you was were, like, no, weren't you like, what color is going to do? And it was starting on a green or something. And he was like, yeah, yeah. And then he started flicking through them. It was like, purple and you were like yes can you yeah. please leave it like that that's incredible that was um, great we ran into some issues in the bar scene with um uh, squib effects mm. where um with chris rowley's character which luckily with some clever editing from aaron it wasn't a big issue mm. um and i really enjoy it was ken mckeown's first time ever on camera yeah, yeah. Ken, um, ken was good he's <laughs> What? Jesus Christ, what the fuck? This is just an incredible delivery of that line. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the bar. Um, but it, I mean, I wouldn't say it was straightforward, but, but compared to some of the other scenes in the film. Yeah, the bar, bar kind of set the tone, really. Like, it it kind of, it set up nice. It, lighting was good. Yeah. You know, performances also, were nice. Yeah. Do we shoot the hotel, like the Graham scene and then straight over to the bar? Or was it the other way around? Did we shoot the bar? We shot the back? bar first. Yeah, and then we went back for shooting yeah. Graham scene. Um, and then I remember, oh yeah, so down by the down by the riverside, down uh, by the river. shooting down by the arch. Yet again, a location that's appeared a few times in different Celtic Badger media stuff, but never really looks the same twice. Yeah, um, all lit differently. And also framed differently. Like, yeah. For example, in Retribution, it's framed from the other side of the arch. Shout out, out. To, to Mike Shawcross for that recommendation. Yeah, that was a pretty pivotal moment. It was starting to rain. We were screwed. We mm. were, that was the, first, the night we were out, the second night we, and we were running over. It was the first time, I think, on that shoot where we had started to run really over. Yeah. And then uh, Mike Shawcross suggested, well, where I'm taking the sill from is actually kind of on, under the arch so the rain isn't getting to me. But I can frame everything here. Mm. And Barry's like, oh, sweet. Get me sticks. I'm here. Yeah, it was so good because it was like, it was properly framed by the arch. And then you were just like, you were being choked out in the floor and the inside. It was like, oh, it's good. Yeah, it was uh, symbolic. It was such a hard part for me to shoot because I had no glasses on. And we, I uh, was blind. I was so blind. Another little uh, insider information. The close up of Paddy being choked out was actually filmed under the... Under the arch. Under the arch, yeah. I completely forgot because it was, it was raining. raining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the wide was filmed. Yeah. Like, was filmed uh, first. Yeah. And then we moved into the inside. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, though, it, I I remember when we walked out to the end of the arch or the end of the pier for Adam to see show Adam grabbing me and putting me to the ground. I was so nervous because I was blind. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, if I take two steps back too far... I'm falling into the river. Yeah. Continuity is ruined. <laughs> Everything is ruined. So I was so uncomfortable at that point. But that kind of worked to some advantage. Yeah. yeah. When you're meant to be a very nervous junkie. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you were still very upset about dropping your cigarettes. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, what was the character's name? Something the Silent Witness. Tyrone. Tyrone. Because Andy Stewart calls me Tyrone for some reason. Andy, please. I, I was about to say Tyrogue, and I'm like, that's that's a Pokemon. <laughs> Pokemon Go. <laughs> sponsored. Not sponsored. Hashtag non-spawn. Non-spawn. Um, so that location was great. Yeah, uh, it was cool. Got some cool shots of Adam standing on the bridge, looking down mm. and looking all ominous and stuff. Uh, we 
we, we, we had, it was a fine shoot down there. It wasn't like the don'ts where we kept getting interrupted by the police. By the police, yeah. yeah. No, no police this time. No. Some people turned up at the end of the night that knew me and were like, hey, what are you doing down yeah. there? Um, and then... They needed the police. <laughs> then, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the... The next location was the kitchen. Kitchen. Uh, which... Oh, another little uh, fun little nugget is the... Um, the scene where Ni- Nigel getting his face burned. Oh, that was awesome. We were like, oh, we need something to sell it. And uh, we got Niall to vape onto the... Onto the... The hob. The hob, yeah. So that when Nigel lifts his face up, you could see the smoke pulling up like his face was burning. It was... That was... And one of the best stills Mike Shawcross has ever gotten was mm. Nigel with his face down with the smoke um, on the hob. I don't think I've seen that. I think it's, I think it's been shared. Has and it? And he's like... And yeah, yeah, it's... It's a really cool still. If you oh, go okay. to the Retribution Facebook page, it should be up there. Um, but yeah, th- that was a very demanding scene mm. physically from everyone involved, basically. Yeah. Um, especially between Adam and Nigel, making sure Adam didn't hurt him yeah, accidentally yeah. and stuff. Um, and the kitchen is quite a small, cramped kitchen. Mm. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of room to work with. Um yeah. And then... The, the melon. The melon went everywhere. Yeah. Uh, bits and of melon. As soon as we wrapped that, then I had to pack up and break down everything. Within an hour, effectively. Of it, get to get to it, one right. We didn't even an have an hour. Yeah. We, we had, like, less than 40 minutes. Yeah. And you had to clean the kitchen and get all that shit done. And Luckily, sure. Kathy was great with that. But we actually brought Phoebe, my youngest daughter oh, to yeah. set in her car seat for I the church scene that. she was down the back with becky and kathy holy so shit. that was the first film set phoebe was ever on <laughs> that's mad um so we went to the church but to give you an insight the church is actually you'll see it in the film take me to church <laughs> you'll see it in the film that one of the key things he passes on the motorbike is this big castle he stops there we get a beautiful shot of it that is the church is technically nowhere near that it is. It's in the Bunratty Castle Folk Park. Yeah. But it's so far away from the actual castle part. Um, but... Clever editing. We... Um, I need to tell this story. We were good to go on the shot. And the castle was lit up magnificently with these spotlights. It looked incredible. Mm-hmm. And then Adam couldn't get up his leg over a bike. <laughs> <laughs> it took about 16 goals for him to try and figure out how to actually clamber onto a motorbike or off a motorbike mm. uh, in a way that looked cool and didn't make him look a complete idiot. <laughs> and by the time he had it figured out we were good to go, all the, the spotlights switched off. All the lights went off in the church. It literally hit the... And the castle, yeah. The, it's just the whole castle oh yeah, went the castle. dim. And it was like, no, no. It still looks great. Yeah. It still does, but it was just such a shame. Um, but that was... Getting use of a location like Bunratty Castle was a big step up from, from stuff we'd done yeah. previously. And then they gave us the use of our crony church. Um, Which is on, on the grounds. It's We had to walk in the dark for like 15, 20 minutes yeah. through the, with gear through this terrifying folk park at night. Yeah, it was it was. Becky was the most scared. That was brilliant. Um, just to jump on quickly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the One of the other big things to note with Retribution. So we've kind of talked cast, crew, locations. Mm. Um, post. It was an extensive post process. Yeah. Um, Aaron edited it. Um, Dave Malcolm did the score. Uh, you color graded. Um, yep. I did the sound mix. Or did Mike do the sound mix? Or did we... I cannot remember to this. I think uh, I did the sound mix. I did. I think Mike... Mike was doing the sound mix, but then he got busy and he yeah, was like, look, I think you're going to have to kind of finish it off. I think he was having issues with the church. Yeah, he, 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 no, I remember that he got, he got work and he had to yeah. prioritize that. So I took on the sound mix. I think that was actually one of the first ones where I really did. Um, the only reason I remember all that is because I mixed in like an old Verfield song, band I was in years yeah, ago, yeah. into the, the bar scene. The bar scene. Um, but uh, it, so in post, I mean, I, I wouldn't say we, faced a lot a lot of massive challenges in post mm. some things that we faced were like the rolling shutter yeah um but we were able to grade most of that out yeah exactly. like it's still there if you're looking for if it if you're really looking for the bending yeah yeah um and then but i mean in post it was kind of a forgiving film yeah 
Um, it wasn't. It wasn't one we really struggled with. Not for the main edit. Yeah. Um, it's the kind of film that a lot of people said to get it into festivals, you might have to make it shorter. But when we got it to about the, it was the 13, 12 and a half, 13 mm. minute mark, it really felt if you took any more out of it, it would lose what it was. Yeah. And I'm not going to do that just to try and get it into festivals. Yeah, no, you can't sacrifice what you want just to mm. just to hit a couple of tick boxes. An arbitrary on the timeline, yeah. yeah. Like, um, But in saying that, it did go to festivals. Yeah. It went to five pretty big festivals. Um, Yo, know, it was the first uh, film we did. I felt that that went to a lot of the horror fest that I mm. was keen to get into. to get into. Like it didn't get into Fright Fest. I was cool with that. Um, so not cool with that. <laughs> um, it got into Horrorthon, which I was ecstatic about. That's a big that festival cool. here in Dublin. Me, Barry, PJ, Kathy, and Fashion went up to it. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah we got some cool. great feedback. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then. It screened at Vancouver Badass Film Festival. In, Which is cool. Yeah, in 2016. 20, yeah, 2017. 2017. February 2017. It was this last festival. Mm-hmm. Um, it also, and world premiered the same day. It premiered at Horathon. It also pre- premiered at Requiem Fear Fest or Post... Postmortem Film Fest in Mexico. Mm. So premiered world premiere was in Dublin and Mexico at the same, same time. time. And it That's also played cool. in Montreal um, at... Uh, Requiem Fear Fest. Mm. It was it was great to see this film get into so many kind of key genre festivals that yeah. I really wanted to start hitting. Um, and I think it was just, and as I say, it was partially because I, I don't know, I felt unwilling to sacrifice any time, etc. to yeah. just, you know, I think the festivals that took it, took it because there's a strong narrative there at home. Mm. And good performances, good aesthetic, crazy motorbike scenes that shouldn't have been filmed legally. Yeah, we, we kind of glossed over the motorbike scenes. So the motorbike scenes were basically filmed completely illegally. <laughs> but like... It, what's the statute of limitations? Can we admit that? I don't worry. Like, they filmed loads of stuff in other films illegally. Like, yeah, Spielberg's done it. <laughs> I was I was hanging out the window of Aaron's car. 80 kilometers an hour. 80 kilometers an hour. Um, Mike Shawcross was basically... Out the other window. Out the other window... <laughs> Um, yeah, it was it was insane. And PJ was driving around. He had no brake lights. We had to substitute his, uh, a light that Barry had for his brake lights yeah. because they weren't working. Um, we drove out to Shannon and back a few times. We drove past Henry Street Garda Station in Limerick. A couple about, of times. About three, four times. And uh, I remember there was one moment where it was like, oh, the guards are the coming. Bridge. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> move me in. And then they were like, they're gone. I was like, oh, move me out. <laughs> The thing is, I think you had your safety belt on, if I remember correctly, when you were doing I, I wrapped my safety belt around my legs. Yeah, my chakras didn't. No. Was, I was like, I don't want to have to tell Vic that you fell out of the air, <laughs> Mike, get back. Um, um, yeah, because I very much knew that if I was falling, I was going to save, save the, the movie. movie. <laughs> because at the time, I couldn't have afforded another one. I can yeah. afford hospital bills. This probably would have been cheaper than a new movie. Yeah, it was only 80 kilometers an hour anyway. Yeah, I'm sure it was. <laughs> sure it would have been fine. Um, we had a couple of issues we, we with that. We did it at our own risk. There was a couple of moments where the movie's motor gave out. Yeah, when, when it was fine at 80 when we hit 85 and I was turning against yeah. the wind. The motors just went. Phew. Yeah, but it happened once or twice like coming up Henry Street, didn't it? For what, I remember you being kind of freaked out. You were like, why are the motors stopping like when we're just in traffic driving up Henry Street? Yeah, I, I, I figured that was just the cable, I think, was getting oh, yeah. tugged. Because we were running the A7S, but we were running it into the external monitor. Yeah. I think it was the cable getting tugged. But I think it was because I, I wasn't watching it. I think I was getting caught on stuff. Yeah, it was... Thing is, for something that was so slapdash thrown together... Yeah those border bike sequences effectively it was like now uh, i would say that's that's a little bit unfair because i had literally drawn out a schematic of the route yeah. we were going to take and everything it wasn't like it just let's just fucking go and see what happens i had i was like if we go this way we get a dual carriageway all the way to here and then we get a dual carriageway up this street and then we come out this way and there's a dual carriageway back here. you know mm. it wasn't totally slapped together but we didn't yet again have a lot of time to test we did one yeah. set of tests uh, the, the week before shotcross came over yeah and we um it started raining that day, so we couldn't do a huge amount either. Yeah, so we got, just got, oh, yeah, I'm sure it'll all be okay on the day. And it, 
It, it was, yeah. It kind of was. We tried different focal lengths as well and different yeah. kind of like camera motions and PJ passing us out and whipping with him and then just letting him pass I by. I had to speak on a Bluetooth headset to PJ. Yeah. He had Bluetooth headset in the helmet and uh, to be like, PJ, like, turn left, quick, we're, we're turning here. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting, it was probably one of the more ambitious things we've done. Mm. Um, you know, it was very cool. Especially at the time. For me, anyway, it was definitely up there. Um, but yeah, and there's actually a lot of the motorbike stuff ended up on the cutting room floor because obviously if you put too much in, it would just yeah. distract from the, the narrative that's going to pl- play, kind of playing out. So we, we had, what, almost an hour and a bit? Hour and 15? Yeah. Hour 20? I mean, it's the type of thing where I'd love to release more snippets of the motorbike because there's some great stuff. There's yeah. uh, the tunnel yeah some good stuff in the tunnel we use a little bit of that in the movie you see it just before the bunratty shot right Mm. uh, about just before the church scenes effectively um big cheat shot uh adam walks up to the door and puts his hand on the handle outside the castle lowers the handle and smash cuts and he's walking down the aisle of the church as we say miles apart Mm -hmm. um movie magic ladies and gentlemen you didn't even know (laughs) <laughs> um, I'm sure someone was like that's an external gate <laughs> what sort of weird world is this with external gates and wireless toasters what do you, <laughs> what do you is your toaster just a smaller version of your house <laughs> <laughs> um, like that's the scariest place for a piece of bread to be Morty <laughs> um, I think retribution as I, I said this earlier but I've got to reiterate it it was the perfect storm Mm. like of all the elements working right yeah it, considering how chaotic the weekend was and how much we had to get done in in such, such a, a short short amount friday of time friday night saturday sunday no friday night saturday no we had, no, we, had to, we had to do sunday yeah yeah nick went home the monday yes we went for lunch with nick yeah. in the savoy hotel also a big shout out to the savoy hotel for putting up nick um, hashtag kind of spawn at the time but not spawn right now <laughs> please spawn again <laughs> <laughs> please spawn again um, no but they were they were really accommodating to Nick um, yeah it was it was a crazy weekend as you say it's a blur I remember yeah. very little it was the first set I lost my voice on <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> probably remember. you know what happened on that shoot, I got choked out and lost my voice. And now it's become this psychological, mental thing that every time we go to a shoot, my voice is like, hey, remember that time you got choked out? You lose your voice again. <laughs> oh, the noises I make in the choke out scene are so ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fucking, I almost got sick. With uh, the gargling the with Nigel. The kitchen scene when Nigel was gargling blood. Oh, He's so good at it. I can deal with so much, but gargling was just... Uh, <laughs> Um, one of the big things to, to note as well is just little things, actually, like Nick's pose at the end of the film was a very mm-hmm. intentional thing. You know, the Jesus Christ pose. Jesus Christ pose. The flashes of, you know, Nick's voiceover. Oh, asking Nick's voiceover. Nick, asking Nick to say that horrible stuff was so hard. Knowing he's oh. such a nice person, mm. uh, it was traumatic. You, you want to tell about the story about when you picked Nick up at the airport? Oh my God, should I tell that? Do Nick you? want me to tell, me to tell that? Um, I'll tell it and you, you'll find, find out and we can get it caught if it needs me. Well, I'm not going to ask for approval, so if you if you do it, I'm going to put it in. Perfect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I picked Nick up at the airport and he's asking me, you know, we're going through the script and there's a part where Nick calls Adam a cocksucker. Since this film has gone out, I've had like at least three people at different festivals and stuff come up to me and say, I cannot believe you met Nick Vince, cocksucker. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry. Like, that's what it was needed. Um, but I picked Nick up and we're talking about the script and he's like, I think, you know, the reason it really hurts when I say cocksucker to him is because he's actually sucked my cock. <laughs> and I was just like, Wow character building here we go and then i remember using that with adam um later as well being like (laughs) like you've sucked nick's cock (laughs) and adam was just like stop (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah it was it was for a shoot that was a blur was chaotic was 
ambitious as all fuck. Yeah. Um, it came out so well. Yeah, I'm super happy with it. And um, it, it's done well on festival circuit. It's up for sale on Real House and Amazon. Um, and it was just, it was it was the formative, in my opinion, Celtic Badger Media Short, I think. Yeah. Because. It was the first one we started to get super hyped about going to festivals. Yeah. Because it was just like, oh shit, people all over the world are watching this. Yeah. I remember we had a moment in Horathon when we were watching it. We were like, shit, man. It was there's like, people this, in Mexico. there's people in Mexico watching, watching this, this right now. now. Going like, oh, um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, padre, padre. <laughs> <laughs> No padre, no, no. no padre, oh, no papi, oh Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was, it was an incredible thing. And yet again, when I went to VBFF, similar experience for me, just watching people in the audience. Mm. Like my favorite yet again being the toaster. But of course, Tristan Risk in that moment, everybody else is like, oh, oh. Tristan's like, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's why you're the best person. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, um, Retribution is the formative Celtic Badger Media Short. There you have it, folks. And that's what we've learned through this deep dive. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty cool. I'll, I'll Anything like these... else you can think of about Retribution that springs to mind? Uh, other than getting glue in Nick Vince's eye and nearly blinding him. Yeah, that was not a good moment. That was terrifying. It was an accident, but Jesus, it was so scary. It gave him, it gave him chatter and flashbacks. I get it, yeah, he was like, I'm back in the suit. I can smell <laughs> the glue. Um, luckily, we did not blind Nick Vince. No, he's still good. Um, you can ask him, legal team. <laughs> By the time you guys are seeing this, the retribution could be somewhere else. So, oh. I'm going to leave it on that Mystery. ominous note. And if it is, expect a link. If it's not... Forget us anything. <laughs> I'm not anything at all. So. Uh, no, it, it's retribution's going somewhere pretty cool very soon. Okay. And speaking of editing it out, time to close out the, this episode of uh, Kelty Badger Media Deep Dives. This was fun. I really like talking about retribution. It was yeah, one of my too. favorite charts that we worked on. Um, one of the ones I'm most proud of. Um, so yeah. Definitely one of mine as well, being fist bumps, super stylistic and really OTT. It's a nightmare neo noir. Yeah, that. It's a post Catholic neo noir. Yeah, fuck them priests. And then the parish is the post Catholic feature horror thing. <laughs> feature horror thing. So like. You can see the evolution of the post-Catholic genre starting from retribution. Moral of the story is fuck the church. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's the thing. That was so pathetic. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Finally, it's the pan. Oh, I need to ride her motorbike in it. Like, that was a connection I didn't even realize. Boom. Hidden lure. <laughs>